Everyone, we're going to talk about the basics of air distribution and how to do some calculations to predict where to put them and what's going to happen. So let's start. We need to understand first of all the terminology. Three main things we talk about are throw, drop, and spread. These are typically some of them in the catalog and some of them we don't and I'll explain why. Throw is the distance from the center of the diffuser to a point where the velocity has slowed to a specified terminal velocity. Throw is meaningless unless you specify the velocity which the jet has slowed to. The reason the jet slows down is because it's inducing room air and as the mass increases, there's only so much energy that it slows down. So uh, typically we report those at three velocities and we'll talk about that in a minute. Spread is typically used for grills. We talk about adjusting the blades in the grills and uh, uh, typically we give the throw at several different grill uh, blade spacings so that you can see how much the throw is reduced as you increase the spread. And we only talk about spread for grills with uh, deflections in the front. The reason that uh, we try to make the jet stick to the ceiling uh, is to keep cold air from dumping into the primary, into the occupied zone where people are sitting. Uh, a jet of air has slightly lower static pressure than the air around it and as a result the air around it pushes the jet against the ceiling because there's nothing behind it. The, uh, uh, we call it Coanda, sometimes it's called Bernoulli. Uh, the fact is that this is what allows us to keep cold air from falling into the occupied zone as it is inducing warm room air and the cold air coming out of the diffuser is mixing with that air and slightly warming up. Eventually it doesn't have enough negative buoyancy to fall into the space and create uncomfortable conditions. So our goal is to get that jet to stick to the ceiling. So let's talk about some of the terms. We need to understand uh, all these different terms so that we can accurately predict where the air is going to go, uh, achieve thermal comfort in the space, which is again the goal, and make sure we select the right size of grill register or diffuser. Uh, the, one of the things we have to do at the same time is make sure we're complying with ASHRAE ventilation standard 62.1. It's a lead prerequisite. It's also in a number of codes, uh, including the International Mechanical Code 2009. When we put data in the catalog, we talk about three main things. Throw, again, is the distance. Uh, the air travels uh, along, typically along a surface. There are exceptions, and we'll talk about those. Pressure, we talk about total and static in the catalog. You can calculate velocity pressure very easily, as we'll show you. And sound, Kruger's the only company that lists octaband data for every diffuser, uh, and we also calculate NC, and we'll talk about that value as well. So here's our catalog page. Uh, we do it in a unique way. We're the only ones that do it this way. It's so we can get our octaband data to fit on the page. We talk about uh, that we list air velocities uh, down the side. Most people put them across the top, but we do it this way. Um, so we got neck velocity, airflow in CFM, uh, total pressure and static pressure, and three throw values. And you see on the right, we talk about 150 feet a minute, 100 feet a minute, and 50 feet a minute. And there's a note at the bottom of the page that tells us that. Our goal is to select the spacing on diffusers so that at full airflow, the collision of the two jets from opposing diffusers do not come down far enough to come into the occupied zone. So typically the throw plus about three feet with a nine-foot ceiling, uh, that's what you kind of want to have at the midpoint between diffusers at full flow, the 50-foot-per-minute throw, which is the longest number on the page. Uh, again, the jet, at the same time, at turndown, you want to have enough throw from the diffuser that the air will make it uh, and, and serve the people who are at the midpoint between diffusers. Uh, most of the time, with VAV systems, in the interior zone, we're finding that the VAV boxes will be running probably at 20% of their rated airflow. So the pitot tube measures pressure, and uh, the pitot tube P sub T is measured uh, through the hole in the end of the pitot tube. Static pressure is the ports on the side. They feed into uh, a, an incline manometer, and the difference between the two um, gives you the uh, uh, static pressure. Uh, so you can see the difference in level. So the total pressure minus the static pressure equals the velocity pressure, so you can figure out what's going on. Um, the the uh, air outlet pressure data we need this so we can size the fan and make sure we've got enough pressure when the system uh, gets to the diffuser at, at full airflow uh, so that we can deliver the cooling we need. Static pressure is the outward force of air within the duct. 
Velocity pressure is the forward moving force of air, and total pressure is the sum of the two. Uh, some people design systems with total pressure, some people design systems with static pressure. Theoretically, you should always use total pressure, but most people, I think, uh, we today are using static pressure. Uh, you need to have enough static to get the air through the diffuser. And this equation at the bottom, P sub T equals P sub V plus P sub S, uh, is surprising, but I see people taking notes when I put this equation up. Um, obviously, we don't list velocity pressure. You can see from this uh, equation that it's fairly easy to calculate. When we do sound, we use an ASHRAE standard that requires us to put the device in a reverb room flush with the inside wall of the room with 10 diameters of straight duct. That's the way we do it with ASHRAE 70. So all the data in the catalog, there's no inlet effect. And we also assume room absorption to be 10 dB when we calculate NC, which is also probably not very realistic. So there was a research study done at uh, University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, reported in the April ASHRAE Journal uh, last year, and the recommendation is that most NC levels are probably 5 NC higher uh, uh, than what's published. So you probably should add 5 NC to everybody's data, and that's not just Kruger, but everyone, to account for the inlet in the room. There's really two types of, of air distribution devices, and we're not going to spend much time talking about non-inductive air distribution, but you need to know that these are out there. In this case, there is no Kawanda, there is no Bernoulli. There's a laminar flow and a radial flow, and these are used in uh, the places listed here, hospital operating suites, uh, high-tech electronics, clean rooms, and laboratories. Laminar flow, the air comes out of the diffuser and is directed downward at a very low velocity. Uh, it's typically a little colder than the room, so it tends to accelerate slightly. In fact, the jet has kind of a Coke bottle shape uh, it's a little narrower at the middle. The highest velocity typically uh, occurs about five feet below the diffuser, which is probably a tabletop. Uh, we, that's what we see most of the time. The other type of diffuser, the radial flow, uh, the TAD and the radial flow, the radial flow is flush with the ceiling. The TAD sticks into the room. Uh, architects sometimes have a problem with the TAD. We've been selling the TAD for 30 years. Uh, it's a very uh, robust device. It uh, delivers air horizontally, vertical, and all points in the middle, as does the radio flow. We spent a lot of time getting the radio flow to give us a radial pattern. You'll notice that there's, uh, it's actually convex. It goes up into the ceiling, has a little deeper back pan. It has a slot on the edges. It has two types of perf, uh, but it does provide an interesting radial pattern. And both of these are mostly uh, independent of the inlet condition. Inlet conditions typically don't screw them up too much. It'd be nice to have some straight duct, but the, the perf inside the back pan seems to be able to handle that pretty well. Most places are using what we call well-mixed high induction diffusers, commercial office spaces. There's a high velocity jet going along the ceiling. They have fairly long throw and the goal is to mix uh, in the room so that the space is at uniform temperature and fairly low velocity. Again, we take advantage of uh, Kawanda uh, to make the jet stick to the ceiling and all the diffusers are designed to do that. Um, the uh, PLQR is probably the most effective diffuser we sell. The PLQ, which has a square pattern, is next. And the 1400 and the PRISM are also very effective diffusers uh, at all ranges of airflows. When a diffuser is not adjusted properly, bad things happen. Uh, linear slots need to be adjusted. Uh, typically, uh, we only make one diffuser that has a fixed blade. All the rest, the uh, internal blades, can be adjusted. The challenge is for the engineer to specify who is going to adjust it. And if he doesn't do that, it doesn't get adjusted. And since nobody does that, most linear diffusers are not adjusted. Some linear diffusers can't be adjusted to give a horizontal pattern. I was at a job where we found one. Interesting things happen when a linear slot diffuser or any diffuser doesn't have ceiling pattern because of bad adjustment or bad design or whatever. Cold air falls, hot air rises, the room becomes stratified. The thermostat, instead of controlling the temperature in the room, controls the distance above the floor in which the stratification layer is the same temperature as a thermostat setting. So it's an altitude controller, not a temperature controller. Uh, it's cold at the floor, it's hot at the ceiling, and more importantly, the thermostat takes a long time to respond to changes in load. In a courtroom in Chicago, we measured 55 minutes for a thermostat to respond to closing the doors and court to begin, and of course, the person whose head sees the heat first is the judge whose head is taller than everyone else, uh, that was a bad thing. Um, what we want is the diffuser to provide horizontal pattern. 
Uh, in that courtroom, we fixed the diffuser to go horizontal. They remeasured the time constant. It was five minutes. So from 55 minutes to five minutes by simply adjusting the diffuser. So we need to get diffusers set to go horizontal. Almost every instance, a, a linear diffuser in a nine-foot ceiling should be set to blow horizontal, even when they're close to the window. Uh, we'll talk about the perimeter in a moment, but the goal is to get the heat load rising from people and equipment to get well mixed so the thermostat can see what's going on. It's uniform temperature in the occupied zone and everybody's happy. Speaking of the occupied zone, that there's a space defined in ASHRAE standard 55 and several other standards. The occupied zone is a space from the floor to six feet or three and a half feet for people who are seated to within two feet of the walls. And in that space, the air velocity should be less than 50 feet a minute at all points. That's a goal. And since we report throw to 50 feet a minute, our goal is to keep that throw out of the occupied zone. Uh, note that the occupied zone does not go all the way to the wall. We have people who want to maintain comfort sitting next to the window. And the fact is that's outside the comfort zone. And uh, don't sit there. Uh, that's the simple answer. Um, I recommend putting corridors at the window uh, in an architectural design. ADPI, you'll hear about over and over again, is a means of predicting and reporting the temperature and velocity spread within the occupied zone. So let's talk about it for a minute. It's the percentage of points that have a calculated draft temperature between minus three and plus two. And that's considered the boundaries of comfort for a person at one met, which is a typical activity level, and one clo um, at about 75 degrees. That works out minus three to plus two and a temperature difference between the average and the point that you're taking the measurement and an air velocity less than 70. 70 feet a minute throws the point out. So the percentage of points that fall within that criterion is the ADPI. It's actually a measure of the degree of mixing in zones served by the overhead system. So that's our goal. When air distribution is designed with a minimum ADPI of 80%, you, it, it's a good way of confirming that you probably meet the vertical temperature stratification or horizontal temperature non-uniformity uh, to meet the ASHRAE thermal comfort standard, which has a limit of five degrees vertical within the comfort zone. Uh, ADPI is the only way we know to be able to predict that. ADPI does not apply to heating or to ventilation-related mixing. It, it's really for cold air being supplied at the ceiling by a high induction diffuser. There's a table in the ASHRAE handbook which is complicated. Uh, you'll notice that the room loads uh, go from 20 to 80 BTUs per hour per square foot. 20 is the highest load we'll see in the interior zone of an office today. Uh, but in the 60s when this was done, uh, that was a tip, they actually had six watts a square foot of lighting back then. Uh, today we have one. Uh, in fact, there's data to say that the actual load in buildings today is under 10, maybe five BTUs per hour per square foot. There's a research project underway in Austin, Texas at the University of Texas, uh, an ASHRAE study to do ADPI at all the way down to two or three BTUs per hour per square foot. Uh, in a couple of years, we'll have that data. Uh, th the table is based on isothermal 50 feet per minute throw, and that's what we everybody puts in their catalog for throw data. Why isothermal? Because it's the only way you can get the same answer twice in a row. You put a heat load in a room and try to measure throw, the heat load screws up the throw. So we measure isothermal, and ADPI is related to that value. Using this table, engineers can assure their clients the diffuser is going to work over a broad range of airflows. And of course, it'll be better uh, when we get the low velocity area, but we've plotted it and we can kind of predict it. And we'll show you the graph in a bit. Kruger provides an additional way of, of estimating ADPI. We have a number of graphs like this in, for every diffuser in our catalog, every diffuser we make. We list CFM per square foot on one axis, half the distance between the diffusers, which is considered L in that table at ASHRAE table, uh, that's up the vertical axis. And the semi-horizontal lines are simply plots of two times uh, that value on the, uh, on the left squared versus CFM per square foot. It's just a straight mathematical plot. But we know the throw at all those airflows, and we know the table gives us a T50 over L, L being that vertical column. So 80% is that boundary that you see as the brown line on the left and right sides. And the goal is to stay in the middle. Uh, most buildings today are designed at one CFM a square foot. So let's start at one and go up to 420 CFM, which is an NC35 for this cheese grater perf. This is the 4200, 4600 type diffuser. Um, 
and it says the diffuser should be located no further than 10 feet apart. Uh, now that I know where the diffuser is, I can answer the question I've been asked for the last 40 years, what's the turndown on your diffuser? Well, you start at the diffuser location, come over to that brown line, and go down, and it says I can't run this perforated below 0.7 and expect to have an ADPI of 80% or greater. So that's kind of the minimum airflow through that perf. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we have a problem with perforated diffusers with VAV systems. Uh, they work great constant volume systems. In a VAV situation, there's a big limit on uh, when you can turn them down. In fact, the job that I mentioned earlier, they had smoke photos showing columns of cold air falling out of the diffusers. We show the same thing in our lab. When you come out here to see us, uh, cold air coming out of a perf falls right to the floor. We have other diffusers that will fit into that same back pan. The prism is designed to pop into that, replacing the perf face. This diffuser with the same back pan, I do the same analysis. It says I can put them further apart and I can turn it down to 0.4 CFM a square foot. Um, in fact, uh, other diffusers will go down to 0.2. So we can get these down very low. Now we get arguments that, gee, at low air speeds, don't we have people complaining that it's stuffy? First of all, stuffy is a thermal comfort complaint. It's not an indoor air quality complaint, and it means it's a little warm. If the space is the right temperature, people don't want to feel air speed. And the research study that was done out in California that you're going to be hearing about over the next couple of years uh, they did a survey and they looked at air flows and they looked at people's responses and there was no problem running 0.2 CFM a square foot in the office. So that's going to change people's perception about the need to have airspeed. Standard 55 for the last 30 years has said there's no minimum airspeed for comfort. If you have uniform air temperatures, everything is working. In fact, that's really all you need to measure. With well-mixed systems, ceiling diffusers, one of the things we've learned is that at less than 1 CFM a square foot, the room airspeed, the average, is a function of the load in the space, not the diffuser air supply. So uh, the myth that a constant volume system will have higher air motion than a VAV system doesn't really hang up there. At, at low loads, they both have fairly low room air motion. It's not a problem, but that's the way it works. And partitions, a lot of tests were done back in the 70s, and we learned that partitions actually assist the ceiling diffusers if they're set up properly. So we get the diffusers right, the partitions actually improve the comfort in the space. LEED will give you a point for complying with a couple of standards. 62.1 is actually a, uh, uh, you, you must meet 62.1, it's a prerequisite. Um, and it's also, again, in code. Um, the ventilation rate procedure furthermore says that if the heated from the air is uh, uh, less than 15 degrees but doesn't make it down the window, you've got to increase the airflow by 25%. And if it's 15 degrees above the room, no matter where it goes, you also have to increase the air supply by 25% to take care of the short-circuiting of the air. This is not a suggestion. This is code. And a lot of people aren't paying attention to this particular requirement. LEED 2009 can also give you an, a, a point for increasing ventilation 30% beyond the minimum. And I believe 2013, the next generation of LEED, will do the same. So, Providing ventilation in the space is important, and making sure that we don't have too hot of air when we're heating is also important. The Kruger elect Electronic Catalog, the K-Select program, can actually do some interesting ADPI calculations. I've done an example here of a 1400 uh, with a, uh, uh, what did I do, 10-inch uh, 10 inlet, 24 by 24 face, and I put 400 CFM through it. Um, and you notice the NC is quite low, 23, but we should probably add 5, which gives us a 28 in the space. And if you've got multiple diffusers, it would probably be close to 30. So this is a good selection. Uh, I can now click the ADPI button, and this screen comes up. And you can see that we've got graphs of ADPI as a function of T50 over L, and this is taken from the, uh, the ASHRAE uh, guide tables. And we can kind of extrapolate down to lower loads uh, using this graph so we can figure out what's happening at less than 20. Um, and using this graph, we've input 400 CFM, which was carried over from the other screen. Characteristic length is 10, which is a space that's 20 by 20, which is 400 square feet. Notice the load is 22 BTUs per hour per square foot. That is the typical load at 1 CFM a square foot in buildings uh, by design today, uh, th which they never hit. Like I said, they're probably closer to 5. The ADPI is 79.6, that's an 80. So we've met our requirement at full flow. I can now go back to the main screen, selecting 400 CFM again, 
And now the screen changes, and instead of plotting neck velocity across the top, it plots ADPI given a characteristic length of 10, an area of 400, and a room load of 22. And you can see that the ADPI actually increases as you decrease the flow and finally starts to come back down. Uh, and we can print this whole mess after saving it, and we print a graph, and you can see in the graph what happens to ADPI as a function of CFM per square foot. This page can be printed out. We suggest the engineers submit this to the lead people to prove that you've got ADPI at low flow with your diffusers, and that should help you prove compliance to ASHRAE standard 55. We've even put notes at the bottom of the page to coach the uh, lead reviewers, the GBCI guys, so they can figure out what to do. Not all spaces have nice ceilings with uh, nine foot ceilings with diffusers in them, so let's look at some other places. How about a high bay application? I've got ceiling that's more than 12 foot high. Uh, and heating is going to be a challenge here. Uh, hot air rises, cold air falls. Uh, don't worry about the cooling, it'll come down, but we need to take advantage of vertical stratification if possible. Put the heating, if you can put the heating diffuser down low, that'd be a good idea. Uh, and what you'll do when you do the calculation, you'll see that the heating airflow rate may actually be twice the required cooling airflow rate in order to get the throws to work out. Uh, keep the heating delta T down. That also probably helps you get the airflow rate up on the heating. If you're supplying air distribution uh, from uh, high up in the ceiling, round diffusers, drum louvers, um, we have vertical uh, jet diffusers. Uh, something with some vertical projection probably will help you get the airflow down. But you cannot use ADPI for anything with heating or any ceiling over 12 feet. Uh, displacement ventilation is a good way to do cooling, but you still have to consider how you're going to heat the space. So buoyancy is the problem. Again, hot air rises, cold air falls. Since you can't use ADPI, what are you going to do? We can estimate throw as a function of delta T and buoyancy. Uh, the simple rule is that the distance to the 75 foot per minute throw is affected by 1% per degree Fahrenheit delta T. Where do you get the 75 foot per minute throw? Well, it's halfway between 50 and 100. It's one of the reasons we put all that data out there. So once you know the 75 foot per minute isothermal throw, you pick your delta T out, difference between isothermal and what the discharge temperature is, and you can do some calculations. Let's look at an example. I got 20 degrees cooling from a jet blowing vertical down. It's going to go 20% further than it would if it were isothermal because I've got 20 times uh, uh, at the 75 foot per minute. Notice that the heating is going to go the other way because uh, hot air rises, so the, the change is uh, 20%. Notice there's a 40% difference between heating and cooling. Uh, you can see if you put the same airflow out, put enough air to get the heating down, it's going to be breezy in cooling mode. Along the ceiling, heating air tends to go further because, again, it slides along the ceiling. So uh, in this case, the 20% along a ceiling actually winds up making the throw go further. <clears throat> what if there's no ceiling? Aha! Same thing, 75 feet per minute. But in this case, it affects whether the jet rises or falls at 75 feet per minute. So in this example, I've got 15 degrees delta T heating. The end of the jet at 75 feet per minute will go up 15% from the throw value to T75. Um, notice, by the way, that 150 foot per minute throw is really not affected by delta T. So now we know how to do throw for uh, jets that are out there. Suddenly we realize that what's this entrained free jet thing that we keep hearing about? Well, most of the diffusers uh, in everybody's catalog, we assume the jet is along a surface. Our grill data, we assume that the grill is within nine inches of the ceiling, and so the jet moves up along the ceiling and uh, only induces air on one side. Drum louvers, duct-mounted grills, and vertical linear diffusers, however, typically have a free jet calculation. And the free jet calculation is going to be shorter than an entrained jet because the jet can now entrain air from both sides of the jet and it'll gain mass faster and therefore slow down. So, uh, and how much does it slow down? The square root of two, 1.414 or 0 0.707 is the factor you use to calculate the difference between entrained and free jets. So it's an easy calculation to make. Uh, final application is weird is a continuous duct. I've got a long run of duct with a bunch of grills on it. Could be our duct mounted grills or could be grills on boots or could be drum louvers. Balancing them can be tricky. In fact, the first diffuser, if you've got high velocity, I've actually seen it draw air into the duct instead of blowing air out. I had a balancer tell me my grill was broken because it was sucking instead of blowing. <clears throat> Use multiple drum louvers. Uh, if you have these longer than 10 feet, size the duct so the inlet velocity 
is no more than 1,200 feet a minute. 1,000 feet a minute would be better. And that means it's going to be a pretty big duct. And here's the thing. Don't step it down. Keep it that big size all the way along. And what happens is static regain winds up giving you constant static pressure all the way down the duct. And the diffusers are self-balancing. It's amazing how well it works. Constant duct size through the entire length. Uh, the balancer will have no difficulty, and it won't be noisy. number of reasons why you want to do that. Finally, people ask me where to put the returns, and here's my answer. It doesn't matter. Diffuser returns are almost always in the ceiling. Uh, they have an almost immeasurable effect. You can actually put a return next to a supply diffuser, and it won't affect its performance. It's magic. Suspended ceilings typically leak a lot, so even if you don't have a return, the air is going to go out of the room anyway. And if you have high airflow greater than, than one and a half CFM a square foot, then you can think about putting low returns in. It could help you if you have a heating problem, putting returns low. It's usually not convenient, though, to put returns low. So summarizing, what have we learned? Uh, LEED 2009 says you've got to com comply with 62.1, so watch your heating airflow. Make sure you understand air change effectiveness and everything else in there. No compliance means the building is not a LEED project. ADPI is the only way we knew, know to assure compliance to the vertical temperature stratification portion of ASHRAE Standard 55. I don't know any other way to do it. And reheat it, or, or supplying hot air, uh, you, you need to be within 15 degrees of the room temperature. High heating supply temperatures mean you won't meet standard 55 and you have to increase the ventilation rate in order to comply with standard 62.1. Uh, the K-Select program is a big help. There's a select, uh, spreadsheet for doing sound calculations that works real well. One of the inputs to it is the octave band for diffusers so you can calculate what's happening in the room. Uh, we provide the octave band data. So there's a number of things you can do to make these things work better. Hopefully all of this will be some help to you. If you have questions, go ahead and email me or give me a call and uh, we'll answer your questions. I hope this has helped. Uh, by the way, LEED is coming out in October. Uh, it should be interesting. We pretty much know what it's going to say, um, but it's, and it's pretty much done. So uh, this is where we stand. Uh, K-Select, the latest version, uh, it has been rewritten. It now inputs into our pricing program, and uh, it's available on the web. So go to the web and download the latest version. We thank you all, and uh, have a good day.